Hello and welcome to Office Hours by Bit Gardner. My name is John Kowalski. I'm part of the marketing team here. I'd like to welcome you. Uh, if you are unfamiliar with our office hours format, uh, it's basically a shortened presentation, usually around 20 minutes or so. And then uh, it is open to you uh, for questions, comments, uh, if you're experiencing any uh, challenges at your own facilities that we can assist with. Um, we have a variety of folks on the call um, so we can get, get those uh, questions answered for you. Uh, we are also recording this. Uh, including the discussion. So if you, um, uh, you know, so immediately following, you'll receive an automated marketing message and that will contain a link. Feel free to uh, watch this later, grab screenshots, uh, either during it live or during the recording, uh, pass it on to any colleagues that you might think uh, would find it valuable as well. Um, also, we are in the midst of planning our 2025 webinar series. Uh, so if there are any topics, any subjects you'd like us to cover, uh, feel free to throw it in the chat box located in the bottom right hand corner of your screen and uh, we'll see what we can do about adding it to the schedule. Um, also, during the presentation, um, use that same chat box to ask any of your questions. Uh, we'll get to them in order uh, immediately following the presentation. So with that, let me introduce our uh, technical uh, application specialist, Mr. Noah Morgan. Hello, thank you for everybody that's joining today. As John mentioned, we will be going over elliptical tolerancing and the evolution of color difference equations. Uh, so if you're unfamiliar, uh, difference equations are essentially how you get the delta E value or your total color difference value uh, when doing color measurement. Uh, so starting off the bat, let's get in here. So if you're unfamiliar with the LAB coordinates, this is basically what the what all of the color difference equations are based off. Of. And so what the LAB values are, they're essentially coordinates that describe where you are in color space. And when I talk about color space, I mean it is a three-dimensional sphere that in which all colors exist. Um, and so using your LAB coordinates, you can identify exactly where you are within color space. So in this example on the screen, we have an L value of positive 58. We have an A value of positive 30. And we have a B value of positive 36. So using our LAB coordinates, we're able to look at the A axis and find out where we lie. Then look at the b-axis and find out where our point is and then lastly we can look at the l-axis and find exactly what color we have and in this case we have a light orange color so with your lab values if you ever measure compared to a standard so when you're measuring a standard and sample that are standard and samples and you want to see how close you are to your standard uh, that's when you would use what we call the delta E value, which is your total difference. And you can see the equation down at the bottom. Essentially, you have uh, your total difference, which is a function of your L value difference, your B value, and your A value difference. And so using these difference values, we can detect exactly how far off we are from our standard. Um, so in this example, again, we have that orange color. And so with our new value that we're comparing to, we can detect how far we are from the L value, what the difference is there, our total L difference, then our total A difference, and our total B difference. And then we put that into this equation, we then get our delta E, which is our total color difference. It makes it easier so operators aren't looking at three values. It makes it so you're just looking at one value. It simples down uh, the what you need to look for for a quality control aspect. There's also some other values that you may not be familiar with. Uh, and this is the C and the H value. So similar to the LAB value, where A and B refer to color zones, um, where A, negative A is green, positive A is red, and then we have the B axis, which uh, positive B is yellow, and the negative B is blue. We have the LCH values, which the L value still means lightness. So at zero, it's dark. 
and then at 100 it's completely white. The C value stands for chroma, and so that means we start at the zero on our x on our on our plane here. And as we get further away from zero, our chroma value gets higher and higher. And so using the chroma value, we're able to identify again exactly where we are in color space. So this is just another way of figuring out where you are as far as the coordinates. So we also have the hue angle, um, which is also used with the LCH method. The hue angle starts on the positive A axis, so on the red axis here, and then goes counterclockwise in 360 degrees. And then using that hue angle with the chroma value and the L value, we're again able to identify exactly what color we have uh, in color space. So with those two sets of values in mind, uh, again, we have the LAB values and we have the LCH values. We want to know when is it important to use which one? Why do we have two? So when you typically have non-chromatic colors uh, with a chroma value less than 10, you want to use LAB values because they are going to match to our visual uh, the best. However, as you get more chromatic in color, like a fire engine red color, it's, it's best recommended to switch over to LCH as far as color coordinates. Um, and that's also identified as a chroma value that's greater than 10. And I'll show you why with the next coming slides. So with LAB tolerancing, uh, we have a very simple box tolerance here, and this is uh, the delta E star equation. So the first equation we'll go through. It's a simple box tolerance. Now what we're seeing here is at the middle, this diamond shape is our standard. All of the white circles that are within that box are acceptable matches, so visually accepting. And then all of the red circles, the red X circles, are visually rejected color matching. So we don't want to pass any of the Xs, but we want to pass all of the circles. And when we look at an achromatic color, we find that our visually accepted matches fall perfectly within this LAB box tolerance. So it matches visually, it matches perfect to our visual perception. Now, when we get more chromatic, in this case, we have a, let's, let's say we have a very chromatic yellow. Uh, as we get more chromatic, we find that our, our visual tolerance has actually changed a little bit. So we don't see color as perfect as the delta E star equation is written. And so what's happening here is now we have a lot of circles that are falling outside of our tolerance, our initial box tolerance. And so mathematically, these all these circles that are outside of this smaller box would be failing. And we don't want that because that costs a lot of money if we fail all visually passing samples. So what we could do is we could increase the size of our box tolerance. And so we get this outside box. Now everything within this box is passing numerically, but everything outside is still failing. The problem that brings in is now we're passing a lot of visually failing products. And we don't want that either. So there's something that we have to do. And in that case, that something is switching to the LCH values and using uh, a new type of box tolerance, an elliptical shape um, that agrees better with our visual perception. And so this is the reason why for achromatic colors, you wanna use LAB coordinates, but as you get more chromatic, it's, uh, it's best to just switch over to the LCH values. Now with the traditional Delta E star equation, um, it does not transition. However, with the Newer equations for the ones we'll be talking about, delta E CMC and delta E94. And then lastly, delta E2000, we see that there's an automatic shift once the chroma value goes over 10, and it switches over to using this uh, elliptical tolerance as we get more chromatic. So here's one of our first examples for uh, the shortcomings that come from the original delta E star equation. So what we have 
is we have our standard. So we have our blue standard here. We have sample one, and then we have sample two. At the top, we see our delta E star equation. So L, A, and B. And then we see sample one. And these are the measured values. So we have a L difference of 0.57 an A difference of 0.57, and a B difference of 0.57. Now with this sample one, all of the difference is spread across each value. And so our, we get a total difference of one. And so that's our delta E. Our delta E for our sample one is one. Typically, uh, I will say that anything below a delta E of 1.5 looks visually the same. Anything above a 1.5 looks visually different. In this case, this is just an example. But what we find is when we look at sample two, we can clearly see it's not matching the standard. But mathematically, it still passes. It's, it, mathematically, it is the same as sample one. The difference is, is that all of our differences just on the A value for sample two, but because of the distribution, uh, it's still, and because of the uh, math in the original delta E calculation, it's still going to give us a total difference of one. So that's one of the shortcomings. So what we find is that measured, va measured deltas do not correlate well with our visual impression. So in this, this perfect circle here with the sphere, this is an image of color space. And when we look at it, you can see small points directly in the middle. And it's best looked at as this is your standard, the small points in the middle. And then those circles around that small dot would be your tolerance, your visual tolerance for that type of color. And so using Delta E star, we find that color space changes or visual tolerance changes depending on where we are in color space. So for example, in the greens, we have very big wide circles as far as our tolerance. But when we look at something like the red, we see differences in hue very clearly. So if we had two reds next to each other that were slightly off in hue, we would easily be able to pick up that difference versus if we had two greens that were slightly different in hue, uh, we would have a harder time recognizing that difference. So visually, visual acceptability is based on ellipses, not circles. So it's best to transition away from delta E star. Tolerance are tighter for tolerance for hue are tighter than for chroma. So it's harder for us to detect differences in chroma rather than differences in hue. Um, chromatic colors have larger tolerances that, than pastel or near neutrals. So for achromatic colors or pastels, we can see small little differences. But for very chromatic colors like fire engine red, as a, as a great example. We have a harder time differentiating that, that difference as far as chromaticity goes. And then lastly, your size and shape of your ellipse change depending on the hue. So depending on where you are in color space, the size and shape of that tolerance is going to, to change. And that's what the newer equations um, mostly do. We'll, we'll talk about that soon. So here are the equations we'll go over, uh, delta E CMC, and delta E 94, and delta E 2000. And the whole goal of all of these developments was to have an equation that could be a perfect representation of our visual tolerance, no matter where you are in color space. So you could use one set of tolerances for all your colors instead of having to go in and physically change tolerances depending on what color you're measuring. So starting with Delta ECMC, this was a, the, developed by the Color Measurement Committee of the Society of Dyers and Colorists back in 1984. It was based on visual evaluation of, a, of several textile samples. Um, right now, it's currently specified in the following standards, one being the British Standard BS 6923, the American AATCC Test Method 173, and then ISO International Standard 105J03. What's special about this equation, it's based on elliptical, not rectangular spacing, and it automatically switches to LCH 
when you are measuring in that color space. Um, it also corrects for chroma hue and the lightness dependent on perception. So this is what that equation looks. As you can see, that's a lot more complicated than the original delta E star equation. Uh, what you have is that dependent on where you are in color space, so it'll automatically switch over to provide the best tolerance for that color. Uh, the big aspects of this is a three-dimensional ellipsoid with axes depending or corresponding to hue, chroma, and lightness. Your weighting factors are SL, SC, and SH, and they're dependent on the color of the standard. So again, it changes that tolerant shape depending on where you are in color space. And then there's several application factors that modify the lengths of the semi-axes. So you can modify the chroma tolerance where you can modify the hue tolerance separately. Um, but as, as far as the default goes, it's a, it's a great equation for figuring out where you are in color space and giving you an accurate a visual tolerance. Then in 1995, the delta E94 equation was developed and, and published. Um, this one changed a little bit more. We see that based on the visual evaluation of new sample sets, um, solid colors only. And right now it is currently published in the following CIE recommendation, which is the CIE Technical Report 116 for Industrial Color Difference Evaluation. Again, this one is also based on elliptical spacing, and it's based off of delta LCH. In this equation, it corrects only for chroma-dependent perception of chroma and hue, and there's no lightness correction. And here we have the equation here. You see it's a little bit different. Uh, some of the big aspects of it are the weighting factors, SC and SH, which are dependent on the chroma of the standard. So where you are in color space, again, it'll automatically adjust those weighting factors to change your elliptical tolerance shape. Um, in other words, it, it'll automatically adjust depending on where you are in color space again and change the tolerancing group to match better to our visual perception. Uh, it also has application factors KL, KC, and KH, which are used to correct for variations in the reference conditions. And the reference conditions could be the illumination of D65, um, your illumination intensity, your background field, your viewing field, and so on. So when we look at what Delta E94 actually does, um, this example here, we have a brilliant yellow, so very chromatic yellow. And when we look at the original Delta E star equation and where it lied in color space, we see that all of these measurements here are outside of the range of delta E. So according to delta E star, all of these measured points are all visually failing. But when we put it through the delta E94 equation, we see that that tolerance then turns into an elliptical shape. And we see that now almost all of those samples are visually pass are passing numerically. And that matches better to our visual because when we look at all three of these samples, we would see that for the most part, they're identical. We wouldn't be able to detect these differences. Uh, maybe in this orange sample here, just because it's slightly outside, but for the most part, it would be virtually identical. This is another example um, of how the color space or how the tolerance will change depending on where you are in color space. So on the left side, we have a bright red, very chromatic red. Um, using the delta E94 equation, we see that the tolerance looks like this shape. But then when we transition to a, a let's say, darker red that is not as chromatic, we see that our tolerance then changes dramatically. We get a wider tolerance for our hue, just side to side here. And then it uh, looks like a larger tolerance for our chroma as well. Um, so we see that the values or our tolerance changes depending on where we are in color space, which is one of the key aspects of the delta E94 equation. 
So lastly, uh, we'll go over delta E2000, which is, I believe, to date, one of the most accurate equations to use. This one was published in 2001, and it was based on several already existing data sets. So right now it's currently published in the CIE recommendation uh, technical report 142 for improvement to industrial color difference evaluation. This equation itself is also based on the elliptical spacing and the delta LCH values. The difference is that there are now five corrections to the C-Lab. There's a correction for lightness, chroma, and hue, dependent on your perception. There is an additional rotation function, which improves the performance for blue colors. And there's also a factor for rescaling the A-axis, which makes an improved performance for gray colors. So a couple new additions to this calculation. We'll see what that looks like here. And so the important features of this is the first part. Uh, we see it's separated. The first part is our weighted color difference part. So this goes over our color difference. And the second part is the rotation function. And I'll show you what that looks like. Uh, but as far as everything else, it's, it's mostly the same to Delta 94, except a few more additions to adjusting tolerancing based off of where you are in color space. And then we have the rotation function here. Uh, and what was found with this study was that our eyes, again, aren't, as, aren't perfect machines. And with that said, we it was found that when looking at blue colors, our tolerance isn't the perfect uh, circle shape as all the other colors. It's actually, we find that our, when we view colors that are in the blue region, specifically on the 275 degree plus or minus 25 degrees, so this section here, uh, we find that our tolerance is tilted a little bit. And so we can see what that looks like in here, how the, they start to slant in this region of the color space. Um, and this is the main influence for high chroma blue colors. Um, and what happens is they tilt to the major axis of the tolerance ellipse in the counterclockwise direction to correct for this. Let's go to an example. So with delta E94, in this example here on the left, um, almost all of these points are passing visual or uh, numerically passing, but when we transition to the delta E2000 equation, we see that now not all of them are passing. We have some of that are right on the edge, but they're numerically failing. And I, I'd like to think that if you were to take these samples and look at them visually, um, all the ones that are passing would look identical to the color up here, our standard, and then the ones outside would have slight variations that we'll easily be able to detect. Um, but that is one of the main features of the Delta E2000 equation. We're going over the equation again. It's a little more advanced than the other equations that we saw earlier, but we see that it improves agreement with visual colors, uh, different perception for neutral colors. For low chroma colors, your G increases the modified A prime compared to the regular A star. And so we see that the main difference is happening in the A value. And then a higher chroma color, A prime approaches A star. And so that's explaining um, how the equation makes that difference in there. And with that said, that is the end of it. And we'll open it up to questions. Oh, whoa. Does everyone need to take a breath after all that? I do. <laughs> uh, thanks, Noah. Good stuff, as always. Uh, first question in here, and before I get into those, um, use the chat box, load up any questions you have, and uh, we'll get right to them. The rest of the time is yours. Uh, so our first question, CMC 1 to 1 versus CMC 2 to 1. What's the difference between them, and which is closer to visual? Yes, great question. Uh, so when you're you're mentioning two to one and one to one, you're, you're mentioning what what that basically is meaning is is the uh, comparison between your tolerance for hue and your tolerance for chroma. 
And I would have to say it depends on where you are in color space to when to use which one. Um, as far as, as regular measurement goes, I would recommend keeping the values as their default, which I believe are, I want to say one, I'd have to, I'd have to look at it, but I believe it's, it's one to two or two to one. Um, that one is ideally the best for the CMC equation just because of the, how it looks for where you are in color space and automatically adjusts. If you change that on your own um, to your own custom value, then obviously it's not going to be as great for some colors because it'll automatically transition to um, a different tolerance grouping if you were in a different color space. And having and adjusting that value from its default could then throw off that color that you would measure. Um, if that makes sense. That helps answer your question. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Um, next one down. Uh, do you know of any work that's being done on color equations for metallics? Yes. Um, I think next week we have a presentation to go over some of the metallic um, difference equations. And they, uh, they do get very advanced because some of them start to take into account sparkle and graininess values um, at different angles. And so, as you can imagine, they, they're a lot more advanced than regular solid colors. Um, I don't know if there's any work being done for a new equation, uh, but I know one was recently released not too long ago. Um, I don't have it off the top of my head, but I'm sure it will be covered next week in that, that presentation. Yeah, and I did just uh, throw the link to register for that in the comments or in the chat box. Uh, and that's titled Benefits of Delta E Combined for Auto-like Finishes. Um, so you can take a look at that, register, and um, even if you can't attend, just register. You'll get that recording link uh, in your email. Um, next question, uh, are the Spectra 2 guides uh, taking all of this uh, into account? You know, maybe you can touch on how our instrumentation handles these different uh, equations. Yeah, for sure. So. Uh, so with the Spectra 2 guides, you can select, uh, you know, what equation you're using in the menu of the instrument. Um, and that will take into all of this account. Everything we went through, it'll take into account depending on which equation you have selected. Um, now, what's nice is that these are all just calculations based off of what the instrument gathers from your samples. So yeah. within our software, you can easily change the equation after the fact. So if you you were to measure, let's say, 100 samples um, using delta E star, and you're finding that it, it wasn't matching to your visual. What you could easily do is then go in the, the software, change the equation to, let's say, delta E 2000, and then uh -huh. you can look at the data again and see how it would match your visual, um, and then make your, your pass fail off of those values instead. Um, so our software makes it really easy, but yes, it does take into account all of the things we discussed. Nice. Um, the key, you touched on the differences between like 94 and uh, Delta E2000. Um, are, are there any inter industries or specific applications that, you know, 94 is preferred or, or vice versa? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, off the top of my head, I can't remember a specific industry that uses a specific difference equation. Okay. Um, I want to say coil coding uses CMC, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Okay. Um, but what you'll find is a lot of industries and a lot of companies mainly specify Delta E star, the original equation we went through. And yeah. that's just due to historical reasons. So they, yeah. you know, since they started their company or, or since they started color measuring, They've always used Delta E star, which as we went over the presentation, it's it's not the most ideal. Yeah. Um, but the reason they haven't switched on to a newer equation is just because of their historic data that they have already had. Um, yep. But that for the most sense. part, yeah, it, may, it makes sense. And for the most yep. part, you know, Delta E 2000 is currently one of the most accurate uh, difference equations to use. So. You know, if you're starting a, a color program or, or looking to get into color measurement, uh, I would recommend Delta E2000 as, as your, 
your go-to. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. Okay, uh, next one here. Um, how does gloss affect visual perception of color differences? For example, um, uh, how are we able to see differences better for red versus greens? Uh, does high or low gloss accentuate those differences, or you know, does it make it hard to tell? Uh, similar, similarly, how does spin and specs affect those different uh, delta E equations? Yes, that is a great question and a loaded question at that. Um, <laughs> to put it in simple, to put it simply, um, gloss greatly influences your color reading. Uh, if you think about gloss, gloss is really just texture. So if you have zero texture, you have something that's very glossy, very smooth. And if you have some texture, uh, you could say it's a semi-gloss. And if you have a lot of texture or micro texture, it would be matte, right? Because the light's not reflecting all at the same angle. It's being scattered and diffused in different directions. And so, you know, one of the, a, a good example just to bring in is, is if you had a, a matte black color, and then you had a, a glossy black color. And they're the same exact material, but when you look at them side by side, visually they look like different colors, right? The yeah. black glossy sample is gonna look a lot darker, whereas the black matte sample is gonna look a lot lighter because of the white light reflection that's being scattered around. Um, so it's gonna, it's, you're, they're gonna visually look different. Um, now you mentioned spin and specs and, and where that comes into play. Um, I believe specular included, which is spin or SPI. Uh, specular included includes the the spectral reflection, so that gloss, into the color measurement calculation. And if I remember correctly, it when you do that, it doesn't take into account. Uh, the, the difference in the surface texture. And in that case, both of those original black samples that we were just mentioned would look identical. It would say that those two samples are identical because that raw material is exactly the same. It's independent of the, of the surface texture or gloss. But if we took a specular excluded instrument and we measured again, we would find that the glossy sample would be completely different than the matte sample because it's going to measure closer to how we would visually see something. Excellent, excellent. Okay, keep these questions coming. Um, great stuff. Um, you know, I know we talk, talked a bit about uh, gloss, uh, but how do factors like illumination, viewing angle, and background affect colors? Um, affect the difference equations and how are they accounted for with the instrumentation? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, within the instrumentation, you can select what type of light source or standard light source that you want to use, uh, what, what uh, viewing degree angle that you want to use, um, lots of different customization with that. And the calculation is really just detecting your color difference um, when using those set defined parameters. Yeah. So once you take your measurement with those set defined parameters, um, your color equation is going to, the whole goal of the color equation is just to give you a color tolerance based off of where you are in color space. Um, so with that said, it's not necessarily going to change much, but you need your defined parameters first in order to give you that color difference. That makes mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. Um, okay, going down here. Uh, Robert asks, what considerations should we make for deciding on what color equation to use when comparing color uh, retention for accelerated weathering or aging of products? That's a good yeah, question. So, that's, that's a good question. Um, so, just to sum it up, if you're looking to find values that match closest to your visual evaluation, mm -hmm. I would recommend using the most recent equation, which is Delta E2000, because that was 
over time it was developed and developed and developed until it got to the best it can be, which is where it's at now with LT2000. So that's going to give you values that would match the closest to your visual evaluation. Um, something you can do to verify or just to confirm is you can take a set of samples that you have, let's say you know, 10 or 50 or 100, um, look at them, make visual evaluations, and then take measurements and get the evaluation numerically, and then compare with each set of equations to see which one matches what you saw the best. Mm. Uh, uh -huh. It most likely would be Delta E2000 just because it's the newest integration. Uh, yeah. You may find something different depending on what type of colors you're measuring. Uh, yeah. But that would be my recommendation. No, that's good. And, you know, if at any time anyone, anyone out there uh, listening and watching us here, uh, if you have questions, if you'd like to talk to Noah directly um, to get some more information, to get some more insight or to uh, schedule one of our, our technical sales reps to, to pop by your, your facility to take a look, we'd be more than happy to. Um, Noah's email is on the screen, uh, just noah.morgan at altana.com. Um, Additionally, any of the automated marketing messages you get, you can hit reply. It'll come to our, uh, my team and we'll route it to the appropriate person. Um, so always ways to get in touch with you um, or with us. And, uh, you know, similarly, if, if you want to test some materials, I know no one gets in a, a whole bunch of samples uh, for testing and uh, reviewing. Um, so, so he's always open to that. Yeah, Noah, I'm volunteering you. Yeah, perfectly fine. I'm always excited to get into whatever questions or challenges anybody has. So feel free. To yep. Reach out. Awesome. Um, how how do another question here? Um, how do color difference equations handle the challenges of very dark or very light colors, uh, where visual uh, discrimination can be, you know, particularly diff difficult? Yeah. So. Uh, very dark colors and very light colors. Um, they, that that went into the development of these equations. So how most of these equations were developed was through a sample set of anywhere, I, I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but it was anywhere between 50 and 100 samples, um, in some cases even more. And what they would do is they would make their visual assessment, whether they would pass or fail this specific set, and then they would transition that and then develop this equation to where it would match that visual representation. Mm -hmm. um, now, if we went through, let's see. So, for example, Delta ECMC was based off of textile samples. Um, so it was mainly textile samples that they're looking at when making these evaluations. Um, and this that's something that's always interesting when you want to dive into it, is see what industry developed these initially. Um, yeah, yeah. And so your Delta E2000 was based off of a bunch of existing sets of data um, that they just went through and matched better to the visual. But for the most part, um, let me think here. Uh, for the for the most part, it's there. The equations are developed in a way that will give you that numerical difference for those colors, even those in extreme conditions. Uh -huh. um, I would recommend, you know, taking measurements if you have an, an instrument, taking measurements of of the uh, your, those extreme light colors and those extreme dark colors and seeing that difference. And also, yeah. I would urge, you know, to try out different equations to see how they would react to those specific colors. Um, it'd be very interesting to see that data, I believe. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense um let's see what what is your opinion on gray shade undercoat trial panels versus standard when using color calculations and how much influence is interjected yeah great question um i don't have much experience with it but i will say if your your main color has has let's say a very high opacity then it be, it would become an influence uh, but yeah. I think it, it'd mostly be based off the opacity of that that base coat that you'd be adding on. Um, obviously, if you had something that you wouldn't see any color, any under color, mm -hmm. it would be 
be negligible or, or almost not even existed, the, the difference. But if you had something that had a, a decent opacity to it, um, you would probably see those differences. So it, it, I'd say it's dependent on what your base code is. Nice. Nice. Um, question here, will there be a webinar or resources available that reviews the guidelines and theory for making consistent and reliable visual evaluations for color? Um, and I don't, I know we do a webinar on visual color analysis. Um, you know, one uh, resource is to look at our YouTube channel. Um, I'll post that in, in the uh, chat here because all of our recordings are hosted there. Um, I also just uh, posted a link to our technical articles on our website. Um, so take a look at that. And uh, there's just a variety of um, articles, theory, um, on different industries, specific applications, you can take a look there. And let me get you the you know at the uh, the presentation we do for visual color analysis and evaluation is a great presentation that goes over all of the different standards that are exist out there that call out exactly what conditions to do the visual evaluation in yeah um, with and without a light booth so if you don't have a light booth you can still make the evaluations you just have to follow specific guidelines um, that presentation goes over all of the guidelines and, and why it's necessary to have those guidelines yeah so definitely recommend checking that out yeah, there's there's a wealth. I, I just threw in the the YouTube link. That's our channel. Um, you can see all the recordings for the different webinars we do. There's also um, several clips and how tos on our Smart Chart software. So take a look there. Um, same thing. The link to the technical articles on the website. Um, if you don't find what you're looking for, again, shoot no an email. Hit reply to any of the marketing messages, and and we'll get the that answer for you. Um, other questions? We got a little bit of time. Keep them coming. Um, you know, while, while people are thinking there, no, I got uh, kind of a loaded question for you. I know, I know you're up to date on all these equations and what's going on in the industry. Um, have you heard any rumblings of any future developments or refinements in these equations um, as it relates to color measurement? As far as solid colors, I don't yeah. know if there's been any work done towards it um i'd like okay. to dive into that and see if anybody's working on something uh, i imagine it would be the cie which is the main leading force in, in a lot of these developments um but i know there is some work being done um for metallic color of, uh, okay color value. just because a lot of new variables were added when sparkle and graininess was was added to our our instruments yeah um, so that obviously adds a lot of other variables which means you have to change the equation and add in you know these conditions um so there's i know there's some work being done there for the metallic side but not sure about this the colors the solid color side okay and i i just one of our um field folks just t shot me a text uh they're doing stuff on jetness for really black blacks. Oh, I don't know. Okay. Those are the the deep blacks. So if anybody doesn't know what jetness yeah. is, it's a it's a special mode um, or a special set of indices that you would use to describe very very black colors. Um, the reason you can't use LAB is because in those cases where your color is is so deep black, you know, jet black. There's almost no reflectance coming back to the instrument. And when there's almost no reflectance, and then you have the inherent instrument noise, so electronic noise with any type of electronical instrument, uh, there's a lot of issues with taking those types of measurements. Um, and so you need these special indices and a special instrument to measure with those indices. Um, and you know, when we're talking about these colors, I mean, these are colors where you would look at it you know, in person and it just looks like a black hole because there's almost no reflection at all. Um, so that, that makes sense that they'd be doing some type of uh, color equation for those deep black colors. Um, 
yeah that's, that's yeah. interesting stuff yeah another um again we have a an article on the website i'm throwing that up here now um on lighting up the darkness of black uh quantifying jetness with our uh, spectra 2 guide pro um spectro so here's that if you're interested or you need some reading material to help put you to sleep <laughs> that would work too um couple more questions came in would you see the jet black in liquid painted surfaces um that's a good question i don't know if they would i mean they definitely could be you know it's definitely a possibility but i, I don't think that would be the main focus as far as where you would use those jetness indices okay uh, mainly what you'll be seeing them used for is you know the development of these deep black paints more um, formulation side yeah formulation side and and let's say pigmentation a lot of pigment companies that are making yeah. you know jet black pigments yeah um, for sure they would they would be using that type of indice uh, but it's not very common you know because those deep jet black colors don't don't really exist they're not as common as of right now um, yeah but that, that could change further down the road as well oh good um thank you sir um gary writes to your knowledge do uh spherical and multi-angle instruments treat the 45 angle the same um within each of these calculations um so spherical and multi-angle instruments are very different from each other um spherical instruments are they inherently have a completely different measurement principle behind it whereas multi-angle instruments typically um, follow the 45 zero geometry but with at different angles okay um, but for the most part they calculate the equation the same but they, they take the initial measurement values very differently that makes sense. okay B between the i guess 45 zero versus this or multi-angle versus the sphere yeah so they right. calculate the same but they gather the information differently got it got it so okay that helped hope that uh, answers your question gary if if not if, if anyone needs any clarification on stuff um just drop something in the chat i can even unmute you um if you want to elaborate on anything um we got about 10 minutes left um in, in your experience noah and working with uh you know a, a variety of, of industries out there with color difference equations um are you seeing uh, similar i guess um inefficiencies out there or similar mistakes when people are using these equations um you know something that you could uh share some tips with to um, avoid those mistakes. Yeah, so, you know, one of the, the main things is with delta E star, the, the original equation we went through, and I'll, I'll pull it up on the screen. Uh, yeah, so as you can see, it's a very simple equation. Um, with that said, we as we went through the presentation, I showed you the shortcomings of it, where you can find issues. Um, that's one of the main things. So a lot of times, it'll be issues where things aren't matching the visual perception and it's because of the equation that you're using the equation is a big part of it um mm -hmm. and obviously if you want to use instrumentation you know why would you settle for an outdated equation that doesn't give you the best information when you can use the most accurate equation that could give you information that better matches your visual representation um, so that's that's one of the big tips is, you know, these instruments can do a lot of things, but they're, you know, almost useless if you're not using the right settings within them. Um, so it's it's important to get all the settings correct when you're trying to take these evaluations. Um, as far as other challenges, uh, you know, again, settings. Um, it's important to know what settings are you're using, especially if you're doing comparative studies with other labs or other facilities uh, where they're also getting color measurement data you want to make sure they match um, and with that you need to make sure all your settings are the same so mm -hmm. between your lab and the next lab you need to make sure your luminant is the same so you're using the same light source 
um, your same equation, the same uh, observer degree angle. They're all important factors, whether one lab is using sphere and one's using 45 zero, uh, that's gonna give you very different results due to the measurement principles. So if one lab is using 45 zero, the other lab should be using 45 zero as well. And then same with you know one lab using sphere, yeah. the other lab should be using sphere. But it's best to keep yeah. everything the same, compare apples to apples. Yep, yep. Otherwise, it's just not going to work, and your data is going to look a little funky. Um, <laughs> is you know, and this is a, a question too. Is you know, when you're looking at that apples to apples, comparing data to another facility, if you've um, used one equation and that lab, you, for instance, you want to compare to, uses a different equation, in our software, can we switch? the yeah. equation so it will you know do the math for you so that you can get those apples to apples absolutely that, that's one of my favorite features about the software is this it's literally just one click of a button and you can change up almost all, the entire set of data that you took so nice. say you wanted to see what delta e would look like with your samples you yep. can look at all the data then do one click and now you're looking at all of the data compared to the Delta E2000 equation. You can see how well they compare there. Um, so, so once you lock in your data, you can then, you know, translate it to a, a different color system, you know, with the math engine running uh, in the background. Exactly. So you can do everything after the fact too. So you're not, once you take the measurements, you're not locked into those specific settings mm. yep. because everything's just a calculation. So you can easily just change that over to a whole nother set of settings as if you were just taking them, which is a very nice feature. Nice. Nice. All right, folks, what else you got for us? We got uh, time for a little bit. A uh, couple questions if need be. Um, I, I just got another text from our, our field person that uh, calculate or the translation or calculation of the equations it's in smart lab not process yes that's right okay. um, thank so you Ray. Anybody's, anybody's familiar with the software uh, or software smart chart there's two features that you can use and one's a smart process which is typically designed for large-scale manufacturing where you're taking you know thousands of measurements a day and you're not necessarily looking at those values um, and then there's Smart Lab, which is more geared towards R and D and small small scale QCing. And yeah. so you can, you know, look at the differences, look at different charts and graphs, and see how those colors match up. Uh, and you can do different trial runs. So a lot of different things are available within the software. Nice. Um, yeah, it's, it's a cool little package. All right, we don't have any other questions here, so I will let you free to get on with your day. I'm sure everyone's busy. I know we are. Um, but uh, just thank you, Noah. Um, thanks for your expertise, as always. Uh, thanks for, for teaching us. Um, everyone who listened, thanks for attending. Uh, again, you know, check out some of the links uh, I put pasted in the chat here. And uh, we'll see you on future uh, Big Gardener web seminars. So with that, have a great uh, rest of your afternoon. Thank you all. Take care, everyone.